Every year, particularly at this time, Sir Matt Busby bears a very personal grief, a grief that paradoxically touches the lives of many people. Sir Matt is 78 years old. For 30 of those years, he has carried the scars, both mental and physical, of a tragic air crash that claimed 23 lives, eight of them players of his beloved Busby Babes, a disaster in which he nearly lost his own life, a disaster that shattered his dream. It's a very sad time. It's a very sad time for me because uh, uh, it's a situation and a position and a, a way that uh, I will never, never forget. I think the whole, the old uh, scene of the tragedy is a bad memory all throughout because it, it concerns quite a number of people and a lot of people who I had a great respect for and regard for. Why do I think that uh, Munich and Manchester United as a club will ever be separated? Because I don't believe that the Munich tragedy made Manchester United as a club. They were on the point of becoming the world's finest club side when it happened. When the year, uh, turn of the year comes, uh, I, the first thing is start saying, all right, well, we're getting towards the 6th of February, and the, you go through all the things that happened. Uh, the terrible, tragic time we had and the club and, and the people concerned. We lost their lives, the parents of these people, the journalists, the staff and everyone else. And no matter how long it is, it, one would say, all right, probably the first few years, it affects you more and you're, you're more aware of it. But, but, Time doesn't heal these things, Paul. It doesn't heal them for me, anyway. I think, and maybe I, I'm not trying to be clever when I say it, I think he was fortunate in the fact that at the time and around the time, for quite some time, he was in no position to realize what had actually ha happened. And I think, I believe that uh, that maybe saved a, a lot of suffering. Well, it was shock. It was utter shock. You know, and, uh, I was so close to Matt, you see. Matt and I played against each other and in the army together and played for the army together. And uh, he captained Scotland, I captained England. So we were very, very close. And of course, then it was the Busby Babes. And uh, I coached the England schoolboys and Duncan Edwards. And there was David Pegg, Mark Jones. They were all in the side. So I, I, I knew the boys. Let's look what England had got to look forward to. We were preparing for the World Cup in 1958. And Roger, who had moved from a, a, a forward to a full back, was one of the top players in Europe. Duncan Edwards was the outstanding player, the outstanding player. And I'm uh, rather uh, sad the youngsters have never seen Duncan play. They always say what a player he was, but they've never seen him. And then Tommy Taylor, he was just coming. And those were three players that were in the squad for England preparing for the World Cup in 1958 in Sweden. To lose this and have to start afresh and to go into a World Cup within three months of the disaster virtually, what it amounted to for the last match, we had two established players left. That's Billy Wright and Johnny Haynes. Tommy Finney had been injured, Clayton was out. And we had the rest of them were people who had played one international match. 
Two of them in the last match hadn't played international match at all. They've been captained. That's no way to go into a World Cup. So you can see the Manchester United disaster really destroyed my dream. It was a tragedy not only to England uh, for Man United, but the whole of the world, a tragedy loss of great players. Well, this is a part of my history as a newspaper man. I always loved coming here because it was such a great side. And I think they set a milestone in English football. They were innovators. They were the first team to come into Europe. And now we're all aware of how European football is, is shaping. But these boys had to go in completely new, and they made a magnificent job. First year, they get to the semi-finals. They were not only a great team, they were an entertaining side. Three kick to United take it by Burns. Headed out to the far side. Very cleverly held by Barry, beats his man. It goes to Edwards, which is a good thing for United. A long one from Edwards down the right wing. Taylor's there. Taylor cuts inside. Flex it full. They're still heavy. And Taylor turns it back to Barry. Shoots. And it's a goal. There it is. They've got a fellow like Duncan Edwards. And people say to me, how good was Duncan Edwards? And I'm bound to say, and I was a great admirer of Bobby Moore, that if Duncan Edwards had lived, I don't think Bobby would have been a cap. Why not? Duncan Edwards played 60, 18 times for England, scored uh, six goals from left half, a goal every three matches. We've sent the forwards that can't score at that rate now. Behind him, you had Roger Byrne. Roger Byrne was a magnificent left back, again, an innovator. If you think of Ray Wilson in the 66 side, well, he followed on a style that uh, Roger Byrne had perfected. And when you looked at the, at the right half position, little Eddie Coleman, he was a throwback to the old attacking wing half. He was a combination between an inside forward and a wing half, beautifully balanced, small, a magnificent tackler. Right, made it by two goals to Take a long one up to the far side, heads go up there. Still bouncing at the goal mouth, it's hooked away out to this side, Peg racing onto it, turns it right across the far side again, ahead of there by Corbin, it's a penalty area, first time shot by Taylor, it's not. And, and then you look at the, the forward line, Tommy Taylor, leave outside Lawton, and uh, you have Lofthouse and Tommy Taylor, and probably Tommy would just have the edge on, on, on Nat even as a header of the ball. A fellow like uh, Bobby Charlton, he couldn't get in the side, he, he, he wasn't a regular in the side. You had Liam Whelan on the ball, a magnificent player on the ball. You'd got Johnny Berry on the, on the right wing. The only reason he never played regularly for England was there were two men by the name of Finney and Matthew. And outside left, David Pegg was, I think, just on the verge of becoming England's regular outside left. Mark Jones. You see, Mark Jones was a schoolboy international centre half, and he was the kind of player that you would, you would have to knock him down to, to get past him. And at the same time, you see, Matt Busby also had Jack Blanchflower. We all call him the best football in centre half in all the four countries. Jeff Bent. You see, Jeff Bent was really understudy for Roger Burney, but he would have walked into any other side. He was a marvellously skillful player. And it was just one of the points of uh, the Busby Babes, as we called him in those days, that they had so many players to pick from. United had been quick to take the lead. This was through a goal by Dennis Violet, one of those injured in the crash. In the first half, the British team were making rings round the Yugoslavs, and they scored their second thanks to Bobby Charlton, another of the injured. This is how all would like to remember the boys of this great team playing typically fine football. Everybody was quite happy. You know, that, that OK, it was very, uh, very bad weather, but all we wanted to do was to get home and uh, tell our wives and families about what a great game we'd seen and happy to be back and bring in our presents. And just as we left the terminal buildings, you know, just the odd thought crossed my mind, because I was in the Air Force, you know, I wonder whether, you know, I wonder whether there's been any ice on the wings and have they sorted it out. But it wasn't a thing that dwelt on my mind. It had uh, started to snow a little. When we came back out for our first uh, attempt at takeoff, then we, we were leaving footprints in the snow on the first attempt, or before the first attempt, as we climbed back onto the aeroplane again. And uh, 
It gradually got a little worse as we tried each time and got out of the plane. What, after the second attempt, it had got quite a bit worse. There was this very striking red building, which was quite clear. And as we came abreast of that, uh, suddenly the, the skipper just put the brakes on and the, the props were just whirring round and, hello, what's gone wrong? Well, we made uh, two attempts before the fatal run and on both of these occasions we had this boost surging which was not terribly serious but it was something that one ought to really do something about and I abandoned the first takeoff and got permission to turn around on the runway and make another attempt and this fort uh, came out again and at that stage I decided to go back to the tarmac to discuss it with the engineer. We set off out to the plane uh, I had a, a, a Rolleiflex camera with me and, and nipped in front of the queue uh, to take a picture of the uh, boys boarding the plane. Um, Duncan Edwards uh, quipped to remark, uh, another scoop. And I thought, well, it's just another delay. If it's uh, just another picture of United delayed. When we boarded the aircraft in Belgrade, I found all my press colleagues had already settled themselves in the tail. Frank Swift was on this side, Henry Rolls, George Follows on that side, I believe. And you see, we always flew together. We were always a happy party. But for some reason that day, I thought I'd move forward. And that was a decision that saved my life. I moved to the forward part of the aircraft because there was more room here, and also because the seats were facing the rear. And there was a, a lot of argument at the time that they were the safest seats. And there had been an air crash at Carly for the rugby team where only one person survived. And it was with, with that sort of un, indecision that I moved there. But in fact, it was a, a happy decision. And here opposite me was Harry Gregg. Now, I understand that Harry was going to play cards, but in fact, he wanted to play with Yugoslav money. And the other boys wanted to play with Sterling. And he just said, oh, well, I'm a bit tired. And he sat there. It was a, a lucky decision for him. Matt, as I recall, was on this side of the plane, just further down uh, amidships. Here was my colleague, uh, Peter Howard, the DNML photographer, and his colleague, the telegraphist. And behind me, there was uh, Mrs. M uh, Mrs. Lucic and her baby. And really, between Belgrade and Munich, I was so bored sitting on my own that I actually moved into the rear of the plane to talk to my friends. We were such a happy group. But anyway, on the vital runs, this is where I was sitting. This is how it was on the third tragic run. I fastened myself in, and we set off down the runway, roaring away. And as I looked out, I could see the red building where we'd stopped on the first two runs. And as I looked in that direction towards the wheels, I couldn't see whether they were off the ground, and I leaned forward and shouted to Bobby Charlton and to Dennis Weiler, have the wheels gone up? There was no reply. And at that moment, I thought, I'll see for myself. Turned, and that was the one moment of fear, because I could see the perimeter fronts apparently rushing towards us. And as I turned again in my seat, I got a terrific blow just behind the, my left ear, and I could feel my senses slipping away. There was a terrific bang at that moment, and as I turned like that, I could see the bulkhead caving in, and there were suitcases flying all over the place. And then as I was trying to clear my head, I couldn't breathe. <gasps> and then mercifully, my eyes closed. And by that time, of course, we were through the perimeter fence. The uh, air hostess announced that uh, we were uh, about to make the third attempt and that lunch would be served uh, immediately we were airborne. At that stage, I thought everyone on the aeroplane was afraid. There's no doubt about it. Everyone on the aeroplane was afraid at that time. And no one was courageous enough, I don't know what you suppose you call it, moral courage to stand up and say, I'm not going. And I feel myself, if someone had, anyone had stood up and said, I'm not going, I feel no one would have gone. And I think it was about the speed of 85 knots that the one of the engines started playing up again and um, after a very short period we overcame this boost surging 
and continued our takeoff. I sat down very low in my seat, thinking if this thing, if the belly of this thing does go up, we hit the roof, at least the seat saves my head. So I got down low for this reason, put my feet up on the, the chair in front of me. And as, let's say I prepared myself for what I thought might happen. I was calling out the speeds as we achieved them. And we got to that point on the runway, which we know as V1, which I suppose you might say is the point of no return. And I called V1, and that was the um, critical point. We were committed for takeoff. I watched the wheels lock and I knew it was braking again, so I braced myself. And at this point, the aircraft ceased to accelerate. And I saw the speed drop off from 117 in two stages, down to 112 and then to 106. And then Captain Raymond called out, Christ, we won't make it. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, Christ, I'm going to get killed. And I've just made the big time. I never see my family again, and I won't see my parents. I remember thinking, I'm going to get killed in Germany. I can't speak German. The runway disappeared, and Bobby Charlton was sat next to me. And I said, Bob, I said, I think we're going to crash. He said, just relax. And uh, there was a couple of minor sort of bumps, and then there was this bang. And uh, the next thing was I was flying through the air, and, uh, after that, it was very black. I said, everything was in blackness, and I couldn't understand this, and I thought I was dead. And I thought, well, I must be in hell because everything's black. And then I, I asked Bob, I said, uh, have we crashed, Bob? There I'm without a jacket that's been ripped off and the shoes had been torn away, and I'm asking Bob if we'd crashed. I don't know what I thought had happened to us. So the people who I think are absolutely magnificent were the people who were conscious. You know, Harry Gregg, who was one of the heroes, Peter Howard, the Daily Mail photographer. He went back in to save lives. And with him went Ted Elliott. Ted Elliott was his telegraphist. Now, Peter Howard went back, and I forget how many people he got out, but from my point of view, he got me out. I made my way through this hole uh, over one or two of the people that hadn't been as fortunate as I had. Uh, <coughs> And, and started to run and got about 30 yards away uh, before I stopped, uh, looped round, uh, and Ted was following me up. Uh, the, the, an air hostess following me up, and um, Harry Gregg uh, had appeared and was stood there with his arms out sh shouting, come on, lads, come on, lads, where are you all, where are you all? But no sense of fear, and... Uh... I didn't think that I had time to be afraid after what happened because a child, a child, I heard a child cry inside what was left of the aircraft. And uh, I think this brought me to my senses. And uh, I went looking for it. One never realized, you know, the terrible tragedy that had in fact hit Manchester and that thousands of, thousands of people were uh, virtually in mourning uh, for the loss of these lads. Well, as you the Welsh team, the Welsh team played Israel at Cardiff in the World Cup, and uh, my assistant went, Bert, poor old Bert, and he, he had my seat and he went. A taxi from town and uh, got the office at the top end there, and Alma George, who was our secretary then, I went upstairs, and there seemed to be no one above. It was most strange, there's no one around at all. And uh, I had a drink, gave her a drink. I said, jumped, you heard, Jimmy? He says, I heard about what? He said, the plane, the, the plane has crashed. It never struck me at all. And she said it again. Oh, I said, we'll have another drink. I'm a quick drinker, by the way, and answered my second one quickly. But uh, she said it again, and she started to cry. And then it struck me very vividly. I thought, God, no. The last thing I thought was a plane crash. So in my John Little office there, I went in, and I, I cried myself for 20 minutes. Couldn't realize it. Heartless players you brought up, more or less lived with. Very difficult. They start to go into different funerals, you know, very, very hard. And probably two will get buried the same day. 
people everywhere, you know, inside and offices, and outside particularly. The men who were killed at Munich, everybody talks about the Munich disaster, and it was a terrible blow for this club. And sometimes people forget the terrible blow it was for uh, journalism. You're speaking about some of the greatest journalists I personally have ever met. If you take Donny Davis of The Guardian, well, he was a great broadcaster, and he, he, he didn't just write a, a, a report. He had been an, a, an amateur international and, an, and a, a county cricket player. He not only wrote with uh, knowledge, technical knowledge, but he was an essayist. Then you got uh, Henry Rose of the Daily Express. Henry Rose was a great populist. He always used to say, people who follow sport want an argument. They want a discussion, so therefore I'm there. Let's find out what the person in the four ale bar is arguing about, and I will provide it. You'd got George Follows uh, of the Daily Herald. George Follows was a magnificent writer. He could have gone to Oxford, and he was just on the verge of going to Fleet Street, and I'm in no doubt at all that he would have ended up the, the best sports writer I've ever known. On the Daily Mail, you'd got um, Eric Thompson. He was also, he could have been a professional footballer, but he was not only a good technician that way, he had a marvellous sense of humour, and he used to illustrate his, his points with beautiful thumbnail sketches. So they were special people. And then you come on to uh, Frank Swift, you see, he was a great personal friend. Swifty was not a journalist, as, as you and I would understand it, but he was employed by the News of the World to, to give his opinions on the game. He got a tremendous sense of humour. And not only that, whatever he wrote or got the ghostwriter to do, always had the mark of authority. Well, Archie Legbrook was also a fantastic uh, technician, both on cricket and on soccer. And he, he was doing marvellous work for the Daily Mirror. When he expressed an opinion about players, players read him because he, his, his opinion meant something. And then, of course, the two local paper men, uh, Tom Jackson of the Evening News and Alf Clark of the Evening Chronicle. Now, Alf Clark had been a very good footballer himself. He was absolutely, th this was his club. Manchester United was his club. In fact, of course, it was one of the tragedies that he, he nearly missed the plane. We were counting, Tom Curry was counting the players as we got on board, and uh, there were a man short. And then suddenly a jeep came up, and it was dear Alf uh, in the jeep. He'd been phoning the paper here in Manchester to tell him, tell him that uh, we were held up. And... Uh, Everybody was pulling his leg, and of course, within a minute, Alf was dead. And if you want to know why so many lives were saved, it was really the incredible uh, pre-planning of uh, Professor Maurer and his staff. Maurer was not only a great surgeon, he was a marvellous organiser. And it was his assistant, the neurosurgeon, Professor Frank Kessel, who became like a surrogate father to me. He went out, and he was a man who escaped from Hitler in the war, and he worked in Manchester at Manchester Royal, and he saw Big Swifty. That's this an English football spiel. That was the first time they knew that it was an English football team. And he told me afterwards, I was lying beside Big Frank, and we were both bleeding from the mouth. But he said, alas, your dear friend died within a few minutes of being taken into our hospital. He said, uh, the belt had, had, had ruptured the, the main aorta artery, and, Swifty died. How do I do that? And he was sort of semi-conscious in a fashion. He said, it's you, Jimmy. And he said, oh, he said keep the flag flying. Johnny Berry's on the next bed there. Tubes everywhere in his ears. No, he's fed to the feet. And apparently he was unconscious for weeks. With Johnny Berry, how he survived, I wouldn't know. And next to him was Ed, the great Edwards. And I sat with him for a while. He was sort of semi-conscious. And uh, he turned his head and he said, you, Jimmy. And he said, uh, what time's the kick-off tomorrow, old fellow? Now, that boy was mortally wounded, mortally injured, and the first thing he was thinking about was playing for United. Now, that explains Duncan Edwards's character better than any words of mine. And then this particular morning, 17 days, I think it was, but anyway, Dr. Graham Taylor of the BEA, as it then was, came in the room. He was talking to Jackie Blanchflower next bed to me. And as he got to the door, it's inscribed on my mind forevermore. As he turned the door, 
He just said, uh, I think you'll be able to stand the shock, but uh, don't tell Matt. I'm afraid that Duncan couldn't quite make it. He died early this morning. Now, when he said that, that was the first time I thought, I can't live. If Duncan Edwards can't survive, how can I survive? Selfish attitude. And I felt as though I was going straight through the bed. And then Jackie was shouting, you know, he was crying. And I said, there's no use, Jackie, he's gone. You've got to get yourself well, son. I had someone say Duncan Edwards had died. I knew something terrible had happened. My wife, he was there. I said to you, you have to tell me what has happened. This is making me worse. So when I threw the names, she either nodded her head or lost her head like that, which meant that one was saved, the other was dead. Why did I take the club into Europe? Why would you go on the plane? I remember my first reaction was never to have anything to do with football again. And this was my mind in my mind. And my wife, my wife went again, come along <coughs> one of the days and said, uh, if these boys had the say that it's passed on, they would want you to carry on. No one realizes I went through hell, come back, and I had no one to talk to, really. Plenty of people around, but I'm talking at my 11 in soccer. And I just found a team of 11. We played Sheffield Wednesday first at Old Trafford. Sheffield team were in, obviously, in the program, but I was, I was when I was Manchester United, there were no names at all. Because the team, we didn't know what the team would be, and et cetera, et cetera. But they get locked the gate, there were 66,000 here on the ground. The enthusiasm was terrific, terrific. Billy Fuchs wins the toss for Manchester United against Sheffield Wednesday. And it's the most dramatic game Busby's babes have ever played. Wednesday and the striped shirts kick off. Less than a fortnight after the Munich air crash, the Babes are fielding a scratch side for a fifth round FA Cup tie. And apart from Fuchs himself, the only member of the original team is goalie Harry Gregg. Now the United forwards are on the attack, and that was nearly it. Brennan takes the corner, and it's in. Pearson shot rebounds, but Seamus Brennan's there to land a beauty. 20-year-old Brennan was only included a few hours before the match. His first big game ever, and he scored two goals. 17-year-old Mark Pearson has the ball. Alec Dawson's ready to receive, and there's number three. Sir Professor Maurer and 30 of his colleagues come to England to be welcomed by the Lord Mayor of Manchester and their host, Manchester United Football Club, which owes them so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am speaking from my bed in the Iser Hospital in Munich, where I have been since the tragic accident of just over a month ago. You will be glad, I am sure, to know that the remaining players here and myself are now considered out of danger. And this can be attributed to the wonderful three and attention given us by Professor Mora and his wonderful staff who are with you today as guests of the club. I got this stage, I was, actually I was in a way, I was, I was terrified to come and look at the ground and feel the, the people at that time. Uh, as I say, the biggest obstacle, once I'd done it and I'd forced myself to do it, myself, I had to do it. Uh, 
there was a sudden relief uh, for me. It was a very trying time. You know, it was bad enough for those of us who, I think, well, OK, I got a lot of injuries, but, I mean, that was me, just me. But here we'd got a man who'd, who'd, who'd built an ideal and just smashed right in front of him, human lives that he'd, he'd known since they were little boys. I would never have been surprised within a year of it happening had I turned around in a coach and saw the lads there. That was the feeling I had about it. Had I turned around in a coach, I don't think it would have shocked me. They should have been there. They were taken away so quickly and so suddenly that it didn't really sink in. I have never discussed a crash with Sir Matt or anyone who was, in, who was involved in the crash. So I think we keep our own thoughts on it and we keep our own, you know, we never discuss it. Uh, so, but I felt I always had something driving me on and I'm sure it was that. I always think back when I've been successful to, to how lucky I've been and wish that the lads were, I wish that the particular lads that went, uh, that are not with us anymore, uh, could have been there to share it because they had a big part in it, you know, because the great drive to winning the European Cup was not just for the players' own personal achievements, but probably to prove something and to make something, what seemed to be right, happen. That night <coughs> at Wembley, it was a crown in glory for us all for the players that had gone in the crash, for Bobby Charlton and Bill Fox, who were members of that team, who fortunately survived, even the players, the directors, the head was the chairman and directors, and everybody concerned. It was a night of achievement with the tragedy there was joy that night. They were still only boys, really. Most of them killed at 21 years of age. I think the country lost a team which would have been the talk of Europe and indeed the world. certain times, it comes back to me. I think that'll live with me all my life. I think they'll live forever in the history of football, because I think they actually created something in their short life in the game. Liverpool have had the post-war greatness, but I suppose you might reflect at times that that would have been Manchester United. That is a very difficult question to answer because everything was going right. And we had the team, we had the players, and we were taking in our stride and going along and winning and winning and winning. And, uh, it's difficult to know what the outcome would have been, but I know it had been outstanding. Probably I'm uh, leaning towards Manchester United, but the players that were there at the time were absolutely on their own. 